Okay, good morning, y'all. This is Ron, uh, Saturday morning, a little after 10 a.m., so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm, I'm excited today. We have a, a lot to talk about. Um, the last time we were together on Saturday, I'm um, excuse me, last Monday evening, we spoke about uh, Genesis 1 and 27, uh, and, and that had me excited, too, because they're kind of tied up everything that we've been talking about. Genesis 1 and 27 says, and God created man in his own image, and in, and in the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. And we talked about that uh, verse describing what balance looks like. That word, that that well, verse or uh, uh, is is what we've been discussing all along, looking at balance, the masculine and feminine side of who we are. So, but uh, we gotta have some other stuff to talk about today. So, if you have any questions about that, if if you don't mind, I ask you to kind of hold them for for now. Uh, I also want to mention this. Uh, Angela had a question Monday, and I know she's not on today because she works on Saturdays. But her question came from Revelations chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And uh, she was asking about the sun. And the pastor and I looked at that on yesterday. And we want to uh, uh, kind of look at it again and kind of uh, uh, see what's there because there's a lot in that verse. So, uh, Angela, when you listen to this, and maybe I'll send you a text, uh, give us another day or two and we'll uh, take a look at that and, and, and uh get prepared to discuss it okay uh so that those are or kind of brings up the speed and i know this is a point where i usually ask if we have any questions we we have a lot today and if you want if you don't mind unless you have something extremely urgent uh i will ask that you hold your questions just for now uh nick experienced something on last week that we want to open up with and 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 uh talk about that i think that is uh has some uh, a great significance to it that that we can open up some things with and then pastor wants to uh finish that discussion or or, or continue it rather on when we we're talking about the uh scriptures where we are with the scriptures where we are looking at jesus uh pulling truth out of that how does that relate to what we where we are right now and what do we, how do we move forward with that? So we have a lot go, going on right now. And uh, with fur, without further ado, I'll, I'll uh, turn over to Nick and let him go ahead and uh, talk about what he's seen. Nicholas. Good morning. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Um, so this is something I sent in a text message to a few people last week, but... Uh, it can it was something that uh, my wife and I experienced, but uh, and nothing bad, of course. It was just a a particularly obvious, I would say, spiritual symbol um, that was uh, uh, amazing to see how sort of in our faces it was, <laughs> um, but. Uh, my wife and I were walking on like a nature trail that's by our house and the nature trail is uh, kind of goes along a uh, little river and while we were walking we were coming towards the point where we were going to turn around someone on the other side of the river uh, yelled over at us look up look up there's an eagle right above you and there was, what we did, we looked up and directly above us, there was a bald eagle sitting on a tree branch. And it was just staring at both of us. Um, and I said, thank you to the man on the other side of the river who let us know. And then we just stood there and stared at the eagle for a little while. Um, and it was interesting because immediately before that person was, that basically yelled at us to look up and see the eagle, um, I had been thinking to myself, uh, the way to recognize uh, signs from spirit in the form of birds 
as opposed to just seeing a bird uh, regularly or more mundanely, for lack of a better phrase, maybe. Um, so because that happened immediately after that exact sort of process of thoughts, I was immediately aware that this was not a sort of normal, uh, well, it had a, a certain significance related to what I was just thinking of. And also I think uh, the overall feeling and vibration we got while walking along the trail. So we were, we continued to walk past the eagle and we got to the place on the trail where we were gonna turn around. Um, and then as we were turning around, I noticed that there was an eagle feather that was falling directly from where the eagle was and the eagle was still there. And the feather fell directly on the path in front of us while we were walking back under the eagle. So I took that as a uh, sign to not refuse that symbolism in that experience. And I almost didn't take the eagle feather because uh, it wasn't necessarily something I needed to do, but I, I did take it. And I we thanked the eagle. <laughs> um, but I remember as I was walking back, I was looking around for other people to tell so I could get them to notice the eagle, but nobody was close enough. There were a couple people, but no one was close enough. And I didn't want to yell too loud because I thought at some point we might scare the bird away, but uh, maybe not. But in, in any case, it seemed like people were just not at a place where they could look up and even see it. So it was just us and other people on the other side of the river that saw it. But I wanted to bring that up and let you know that it happened because that was, I believe, an example of a very obvious uh, what you might call a uh, synchronicity or a very, uh, spiritually resonant and symbolic event, uh, especially because of what I was thinking about beforehand. And the nature of your own thoughts and awareness, the nature of your own uh, feelings, etc., are significant when considering what it is that uh, when considering whether or not what it is you have experienced was something that was uh, more obviously for your spiritual benefit, or when what you experience is uh, something that is more directly a message, for example. So I bring that up because that was uh, very obviously a message. Now, specifically what the message is for, uh, I don't know, but I would say that actually it's not necessary to get into specifics because the overall feeling that we had while we were walking um, was, I think, confirmation of, um, well, is what I think is confirmed by the message that we received. So uh, it's not that there's like a, intellectually describable or definable message in the moment, but depending on the nature of the experience, you know, there could be something that you immediately recognize, etc. But in this case, it was more so the uh, general reason we went out and the vibration and frequency that we experienced while being out in nature related and uh, I think it also related to things that we were uh, talking about and developing leading up to walking in the woods. But anyway, I bring that up uh, as an example of those kinds of things that are uh, normal and to be expected, but not necessarily sought out. Uh, but they are a part of what you can uh, receive while you are in the process of examining yourself and developing yourself spiritually. 
and they can help messages like this uh, and in any form uh, can help you recognize when it is you are on the correct path, in our case, literally. <laughs> um, but I would say that those kinds of messages are more obvious when you are out in nature because the natural world is more connected to uh, spirit. Now, perhaps there's a better way to explain that, but there's nothing that is not connected to spirit, or rather the uh, sort of symbolism present in nature is more, uh, it has been subject to much less obfuscation or being changed by our influence or our intellect, et cetera. Can I ask yes. a question, Nick? Yes, sir. The sages have said that your righteousness permits you to make interpretations. So if that be the case, what did you feel? What do you think that message is? Or what would you want it to be? Um, I believe I knew what it was. My wife and I had just had a conversation. If you want uh, to share it, if it's personal, you know. I, I, oh, yeah. No, it's no problem. Uh, my, my wife and I basically had a conversation the night before regarding uh, our need to improve ourselves, not just physically, but also our uh, aspects of our relationship. Like We had become too... Uh, I don't know. I just become absorbed in whatever personal project I'm working on. And she becomes absorbed in things that, you know, she's interested mm -hmm. in. We uh, need to connect more specifically with the, the need to unfold each other's own spiritual development in certain ways, I think. And one of the things we wanted to go for a walk was to do exactly that, to spend more time together, but also to uh, just reconnect uh, to something that was not whatever it is we're working on in the house. Okay. So Nick, um, based on what you just said, because I go ask the same question as Ron, based on what you just said, um, when you, would you not say that um, it was a message for you and her in terms of the pathway that you had chosen, that you're on the right path, uh, in terms of um, spending more time with each other rather than project, a as well as uh, an overall uh, message about humanity as well, um, that um, we as humans are on the right track in terms of um, <clears throat> what we see around us versus um, what we would like to see. The, what we would like to see is harmony. Yet everything around us appears to be just the opposite. Uh, I, I think that, that it may be a twofold message, speaking to both of those. What do you think? Um, yeah, I can absolutely see that because there was a, uh, during this week, I was, had a similar thought, uh, and I, I forget where, I think I was on the train, but it was, uh, I had absorbed a little bit too much bad news. <laughs> uh, and I remember looking out the train and I was thinking that I was like, wait a minute, this can't be correct. And then a bird flew up directly in the tree in front of me. And then my whole thought attitude changed. That was this week. It was just a regular bird. <laughs> but it was uh, interesting that it happened that moment and it occurred in that way. So I think those two are very much connected. Well, I guess, you know, and in the course of time, Pastor talks a lot about the birds that he see in his yard. Kathy talks a lot about the birds. And I don't know if you guys remember uh, on last, I think it was last Sunday, 
um, we could hear the birds chirping as Kathy was was talking. And, and uh, I, I don't think these things are coincidences. Uh, so uh, appreciate yep. your sharing. Maybe, maybe something more we, we could look at with this. Maybe there's a, um, you know, that one seemed to be personal to you. And that's, that's, and maybe that's what they all are. Maybe they're individual opportunities to to see who we are, but uh, I don't think they're coincidences at all. I agree, and it was personal, but there also was there's nothing we do is personal, <laughs> in the sense that everything we do, uh, Morning, we do it with the oh. Well, let me, everything we do, if we do it with the desire to grow spiritually, has an effect, as we yeah. You know, um, so especially when it happens in a more with more than one people, especially when it happens with people you are intimate with. Uh, so that vibration is not just something that affects us; it is something that affects all of humanity and everybody we're connected to. And in those situations, especially, that is where I believe messages like that can come through more clearly. Because you are connecting to something that is not just personal, quote unquote, in the mundane mm -hmm. sense. Uh, but it is a vibration that all things are connected to. And it is when you connect to that in a more conscious way or in a more proactive way that you then see the way Uh, if you think about it like a, a string on a musical instrument, your own spot of vibration affects everything else on that string. And it becomes more obvious. And the ways in which that vibration is shared in the form of messages become more obvious. Uh, because we're all participating on that same wavelength. Anyway, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Good morning, Ron. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Good morning, George. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I just wanted to, you know, respond, you know, to Nick's um, and his wife's vision in reference to the ball eagle. And something that I, I shared was feeling, you know, as an eagle that we're soaring to new heights. What do I mean? You know, when you were started earlier, Ron, there was three words that I heard that are in the principles of Mayotte. And your mm -hmm. first word I heard was balance. Yeah. Second word, when you talked about the sages was righteousness. And the last word that Pastor mentioned was harmony. So I think that when we talk about soaring to new heights, you know, this foundation, you know, that we are elevating in, with regards to where we are, I apologize. That's my granddaughter. Um, it made us. It made me just think about you know walking with God or, or walking with you know your wife Nick, but just being able to appreciate you know the experience of being able to not just know what the eagle represents, but what does it mean to us? So where new life was generated and new possibilities coming to being, I think is just again. The fundamentals of these principles, you know, that we are meditating on, the words that we hear is all relevant to where we all are. And just to be able to walk and talk with each other in nature or just being able to appreciate, you know, mother nature, you know, is a blessing. So I, I just wanted to share those thoughts because I know that it may be something that, Nick, you experienced in your life personally, but look how what you shared open up that possibility for us to soar to new heights. So I just want to share those thoughts, um, everybody. Thank you for letting me share. Bye. Uh, one of the things that that came to my mind, George, was, was beauty. I, I remember when some years ago, the first trip we made to Philly, and George took a, a few of us on a, a trip into the woods and we're walking in this path. And we stop every so often, and, and George will point out stuff that he see. And and as we, you know, got further and further along, it it became more than just a walk through the woods. I could see the beauty of it. I could see, and and I didn't, you know, 
I don't know if we had even talked about balance then and 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 equating those two things, but uh, it, it just gives you a different mindset. And and uh, I, I can picture Nick and his wife walking and and uh, seeing this thing and everything just becoming more beautiful. Thing, everything just becoming more balanced. And and uh, even even at, at one point, I think another episode you you mentioned that your mindset changed when you saw a bird, even though you may not even remember what the bird was, the type of bird, but it changed your mind or, or, or softened you in a way. So these are all beautiful things, observations that that brings, that centers us and, and brings us into harmony, as you were saying, George. And, and uh, so everybody, I appreciate the experiences and appreciate your sharing. Anyone else? I just I just want to thank Nick for sharing this all. Because I think it's a message to all of us. So do I. Okay. Well, uh, if there if there are no any more questions about that, we'll uh pastor. Uh, All yours. Good good morning, everyone. Uh, Rev, forgive me for interrupting you before you. C can barely hear you, Georgia. Are you? Can you? George. Hey, forgive me. I just need to. I need to break down and get me another headset. Um, one of the things I just wanted to add. Uh. Uh, when you look at balance and, and harmony, um, in in Nick's narrative, if nature brings his balance, he's going to see some things by walking in a park that I may not see or I may not experience because he's connected um, to that arena. And everyone has a different arena that brings them balance. And uh, the area that brings me balance or where I'm really comfortable in is the barber shop or, or, and or the beauty parlor. And the reason why it just brings me balance or I'm comfortable, I don't have to be George. I don't have to be quick saying I can just be comfortable. And in the barbershop, and when I say barbershop, my barbershop has the presence and the position of females. Females cut hair, too. Um, and I'm comfortable in, an, in that arena of where there's balance. So whatever you're connected at or what, what you're connected to, it can be in lecturing, it can be in cooking it could be in detailing your yard if you're connected to it you're going to see some things in that arena that other people may not experience so that's all i had to say thank you i like uh and 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 uh appreciate your observation george and, and you're exactly right uh that thing that you pursue gives you those opportunities to be connected and being, you know, or uh, uh, with with that environment, or uh, that that's that's well said. Or uh, I, I think too, you you further illustrate the point of what we do on this phone and and the connection, what that looks like, and especially when we talk about masculine and feminine energy. Uh, my feminine energy not only is shared by what is in me but is shared by what is is in me the energy that i feel from everybody on this phone or uh, i i feel the energy of audrey i feel the energy of kathy i feel the energy of pastor of nick so and 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 that is why sometimes uh you've heard me say in the past if somebody comes to me with an issue that maybe i can't solve i always tell them i can help you because of you guys I can help you because I feel we are an extension from each other, of each other, excuse me. So uh, 
that's that connection. If 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 it is it's there if you allow it to be. And uh I also think that unlike just connecting uh with certain individuals or a certain environment, or whatever you pursue, or uh, what we are doing is connecting with the universe. We are searching for truth, and truth has no boundaries, and, and that energy is is getting stronger and stronger as we stay on this journey. So uh, I, I, I like your example, and I, I think it uh, adequately fits what we're doing here. So thank you. A anyone else? Any? Okay. Okay. Um, <clears throat> thank you, George. A few weeks ago, I made a statement. It just fell out of my mouth without me even thinking about it. And that statement I made was, Jesus, Jesus never existed. And I'm not going to lie to you. After I made that statement, I, I regretted having made it. Not because I didn't believe it, but because I know um, how how much confusion it could create. However, I had to come to a realization that the truth uh, uh, creates discomfort, especially when we've been lied to for so long. Uh, I, I approach this with great trepidation uh, because I, I do know the depth of our belief uh, in Christianity. And even though we have talked about uh, not being uh, Christians, we are simply spiritual. There were Christians before there was Jesus. And I, I would like to um, talk to you about it. However, I need to lay a, a, a um, foundation before I'm able to do it. And I'm not going to bore you with uh, a lot of date. I simply to. I think you're breaking up a little bit. Maybe try uh, turning up your video. Yeah. Kathy, you're, freeze, you're freezing up. Uh, Am I? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, um, and maybe uh, issue with my uh, internet, like I'm frozen right now. But can you hear me? Yes. Even though I'm frozen. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I don't mind being frozen as long as you can hear me. Um, I want to um, embark on, on this journey in the simplest way possible and land the foundation. I, I have to do this in order to get to the place where Jesus was uh, came into our existence by humans to by, by birth. In 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 the in, in 332, um Alexander, Alexander, well, in 3 330, rather, Alexander uh the Greek invaded uh, invaded Egypt and when he invaded Egypt, desired to become a part of the uh, spiritual community in Egypt, meaning that he wanted to um, join uh, the, the religious set in, in Egypt. Now, when I speak the word religion, I am not talking about what Christianity has made religion uh, Okay. Hey, Pastor. 
Am I the only one having difficulties, y'all? Hearing him? No, no. I, I, uh, I am too. Passive. Uh, if you don't mind, sh shut off your your video and see if you can uh see if the audio comes back because you you we've lost you. While we're waiting on Pastor to come back, I just want to say something. I, I, I think the thing with the birds is maybe something at some point we can pay another tip, some, uh, uh, more attention to, uh, because it 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 comes up often, and maybe it's a message there that uh that that we can we can take a look at uh, what what the birds symbolize, different types of birds or just birds period what they symbolize and spiritually and uh see if there's a message in there for us as i'm sure it is but it just keeps coming up hey ron uh this is audrey hey audrey i, I think too there's a there's a message about us getting back into nature yeah um because nature has a way of of pulling you out of yourself in terms of helping you forget your day-to-day -day problems and that kind of thing um and it helps connect you to the universe because you see the beauty and the wonder of it um yeah. And because of all of that, it helps to bring balance to to you. So there is an important message about getting back into nature. I, I couldn't agree more. And that, maybe that's something uh, we, we can look at. And, and the funny thing about that, I, I, I think about it every time we, we talk about it on the phone and you know, somebody mentioned it. And, and I get so busy in, in, in daily stuff until I, I I don't take those walks as Nick talked about and and you know, just stop and, and reflect things. I, I don't do that as often as I need to. But yeah, thank you. Yeah, and, and also you know Ron and RJ, I, I appreciate you you know bringing up the subject and staying on nature. But I just want to read something to you from the Seven Principles of my yacht, and you know Pastor mentioned the word harmony. Mm -hmm. But it says, harmony, the state of being in which different expressions of Mother Nature's God and the goddesses, the spirit, humans, animals, plants, etc., move together in ways that create alignment and beauty. So each expression must be authentic and express fully all that is created to be. It's only through authenticity that harmony can truly be achieved and occur naturally when each entity is being true to itself, to its spiritual reality. And so as you were talking about, Ron, that sometimes when you're asked questions, you know, you tap into the spirit and energy, you know, of that oneness that we all are. And that's yeah. what the harmony, you know, is all about when well, we talk about appreciating nature, as Audrey mentioned. So I think, as uh, you said earlier, it's something that, you know, we just need to, you know, maybe um, meditate on and look at how we can bring spiritual enlightenment, you know, to our family. I just wanted to share, you know, that point on harmony. And, and may I just add one thing, please? Yes, ma'am. Um, every, every, every time somebody says something, it strikes something else. George talks about authenticity. And what does it mean to be authentic? It, it says, oh, it's only through authenticity that we can do this. And so authentic means, you know, the real deal. You're, you're really who you, who you are. 
You are not there trying to um, front or put yourself out to be more than you are. Uh, you, you know who you are, and you come from that place of knowing um, as you relate to, to nature. The other thing about um, nature, as Audrey said, is that uh, it, it, it reminds you of your true relationship with everything. It, 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 as, as she said, you, you, don't, you don't think about your day-to-day -day distractions, things like that. It just, it's a place of being. It, it, it's a place of being and experiencing, not just knowing about yeah. things. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. B. Yeah, that's, that's something we, we'll take a look at. I, I think this is speaking to us. Okay. Pastor, uh -huh. you back? Yeah, yeah, I am. Okay. Uh, somebody else would be ready to say something. Okay. Uh, I apologize for what for being disconnected. I don't know what's going on. But anyway, um I'm I'm on my on the phone now as opposed to being on the computer. Now it came it just came back up. Yeah, I see it coming back up. Yeah. Um in order to continue, let me say that um this whole idea of um recording in progress. I'm going to try this again. Okay. Um, as I was saying, Alexander uh, died, and, and when Alexander died, his general, the one his major, his, um, his general who had grown up with him, named Ptolemy, was uh, placed on the throne in Egypt or in Kemet. And him being um, placed on the throne in Kemet, his desire was the same as um, Alexander's was. And he wanted to join the priestly society, but they wouldn't let him. They, they told him that um, he could not be a part of it because he was uncivilized. Now, how did he get on the throne? He, he was placed on the throne uh, because of, uh, of um, the, the brutality with which they, that they used in uh, conquering uh, Egypt. So uh, Ptolemy was called Ptolemy Soter. He demanded to be called Ptolemy Soter. And being called Ptolemy Soter, he, um, he 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 made them call him to uh, to limit Soter because Soter means to save, and he presented himself as the savior, the savior uh, of uh, Egypt. This was the first time that any European has sat on the throne in Egypt. Not only did he desire uh, to, um, to be ma made, uh, made a part of the society, the reason he wanted to do that is because he wanted to be a god. And in order for that to happen, of course, he had to be baptized into, into the society, circumcised, etc. But also, he had to be accepted by the priests. Contrary to popular belief, the Pharaoh was not worshipped as a god. In Kemet, there were no human forms worshipped. Pharaoh, the Pharaoh was like the president of the United States is. 
the Pharaoh was the the one who was uh, um, purposed to bring into existence uh, and maintain harmony. That's it, harmony throughout the community. And the harmony that he was charged with maintaining also, also was inclusive of making sure that everyone in every part of the kingdom was taken care of. That in, that brings balance. There were, there were there was no conflict between the rich and the poor. There was no conflict uh, between uh, people based upon greed, et cetera. They they were well versed in spirituality, and that was the the uh, responsibility of the priestly society. And when I say priestly society, <clears throat> I'm talking about male and female because the idea of gender did not exist. Gender is a new thing. Gender divides us as humans. Gender leaves a gap between us. That's just happening again. I, I can't hear you. Yeah, I think that computer cut out. Yeah. I guess they'll see you though. If my, my question was just going to be you started with the invasion. What was the state of Kush before this invasion? How did this come about? Um, before the before the invasion, uh, Kush was. Um, I'm trying to get this thing off. I'm tired of it. It's not even responding to the touch. Uh, Kush was um, a very productive uh, area uh, country. I mean, I'm sorry, city. It was productive in that. Uh, that Kush did not, Kush did not um, have problem. Did not, did not have problem within its, within its uh, borders. It was a totally different society that others were accustomed to. Um, it was peace and harmony in this in the uh, society. And that peace and harmony uh, was um, targeted, I mean, was broken, rather, by the, um, the, the uh, invasion of the Greeks. Okay. And this was not the first time that the Greeks had been uh, to, um, uh, to um, Kemet. They had been there uh, prior to the invasion. They had they had been there uh, prior to the invasion, and they saw uh, what existed in Egypt, and they wanted it. So they they uh, sought to take it. And when, as I said, when they went in there, when they invaded. Uh, they brought uh, disorder to the country. And Alexander um, the uh, the Greek is the one who came in, led the invasion into Egypt. And in leading that invasion, he um, wanted to, and I'm repeat myself and I know it, he wanted to become um, part of the um, religious society. Then when he died, Ptolemy wanted to become a part of the society because uh, they, they believed that the Pharaoh was God, but they knew in order for you to become a part of the, the uh, religious or the spiritual society, you had uh, to be baptized in a male being circumcised. And 
the religious society or the spiritual society refused to accept them because they saw them as being uncivilized. Keep in mind uh, that when they went into uh, Egypt to invade, they could not read, nor could they write. And, and so they would not have been able uh, to read the writings, the sacred writings, in order to understand what, um, what the mysteries were and how the society functioned. They were not able to read. So, uh, of course, they forced the, the uh, Kemites uh, to speak Greek. And when the Kemites started speaking Greek, something uh, they attached to it uh, an alphabet. And they started writing the, uh, what the, the Greek language based upon the alphabet that they created for the Greek language. And you will find that uh, in the uh, Rosetta Stone, uh, understanding of the Rosetta Stone, the Greek alphabet came from Kemet. Now, so we, we moved from um, to Lemmy, making an effort uh, to be a god. We moved from that, and what do we begin to see? We began to see the, the, the anger of Ptolemy Soter, Soter meaning the Savior. We began to see the anger there. And what happened when he approached a group of priests, because there were sectors, uh, priests in every sector in Kemet as well as the rest of the kingdom. When he, when he approached them, and they refused, he had them beheaded. And he went to another group, he had them beheaded. So he, he went to Memphis, and the Memphite group of priests uh, agreed to accept him into the society, or to, into the uh, sacred community. However, the all the rest of the priests throughout Kemet, throughout the kingdom, rejected that. Reject, rejected the Miphite priests because they had capitulated to um, this uncivilized person. And when they did that, they wanted, uh, they made um, to limit a god. How did they do that? So Lemmy wanted to be a god, so in, co in collusion with uh, the Miphite priests, they took the name Osiris and the bull Apis. Osiris was the masculine energy of the kingdom. That's what it represents. And uh, uh, Apis was the bull uh, that was there in the um, temples with Osiris, the bull was not a being worshipped. The bull was a symbol of the power and the strength of um, Osiris, as well as the power and the strength of the priest. And they combined the name Osiris with Apis, and they called it Serapis. Serapis became the God uh, created by the priesthood and Telemi. So in order to honor Telemi, the Memphite priests had an image made of Telemi. In other words, there was a, a, a statue or a bust made of the face of Telemi. And Telemi became uh, Serapis, meaning that his image, his face, is, was no different than the face of Jesus. Jesus became Savior man, as a man. Serapis became Savior as a man. But all of it was illegitimate because it was made, it was brought into existence by man with, and totally disregarded the foundational principles of spirituality, as well as the Mayotten principles. So when when they, uh, are there any questions so far? 
And I know with the interruptions, this has been confusing. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Yeah, we can hear you. Are there any questions so far? So, go ahead. Well, I said not for me. Oh, okay. Um, so, with with Therapis, uh becoming the God, um, we had phrases like uh, Serapis is the savior of humanity, the savior of mankind. So, um, he, Serapis is, um, it, it, it is is the one who who delivers us at the death, saves us at the death, the one who raises the dead. All of these terms were applied to uh, to, Lim, uh, to uh, Serapis, who is the image of the Lemmy. It is no different, when I say the image of the Lemmy, it's no different than someone making a, a, a statue of my face, uh, I'm sorry, a bust of me, and uh, and my image, my likeness, my face becomes the, the face of God to them. That's what um, that's what Telemi did with Serapis. Now, as we move along with them, bringing uh, giving more and more power uh, to Serapis, we began uh, to um, to get to a place where uh, Serapis. Is uh, there's a desire to spread the, the belief of Serapis around northern uh, Africa and and uh, all of Europe? Hearing that for a moment, this is where uh, this this was shortly before the Romans uh, entered um, Yemen. We have been taught that Christianity came from Rome. It didn't. Christianity came from Rome and Greece. It was the, the collusion between the Greeks and the Romans, and you'll see that later. So, <clears throat> so what happened is that was a, a, a uh, night, the Nic uh, Nicene Conference. A council was brought was called into existence. The reason they had the Nicene Council, it was not to write a Bible or to make a Bible. The reason they had the Nicene Council um, is because um, the Lemmy wanted or wanted to make Serapis acceptable to all of Kemet by force if necessary. And he chose a priest, Sylvester the first. And this African priest was the one who was instructed to call the Nicene, the, the council uh, uh, together at Nicaea. And the, the Nicene conference consisted of um, spiritual uh, holy men from around the country. And, and when they got to the uh, conference of the council, Sylvester on behalf of um, Telemis presented uh, Serapis uh, as being the savior. There were Can I ask uh, a question? Yes. Most of these holy men from around the country, these were Africans is what you're saying or, or were these the Greeks that had taken over? Every one of them were Africans. Okay. And, and and but they had most of them had been handpicked by um, Pharaoh, which is the Greek. And the reason it was done this way is because Telemi knew that there was not a chance of being uh, accepted into the religious society. Plus, there was not a chance. He did not have a chance in hell of, of bringing people to a state of believing in Serapis. So he picked, he handpicked Africans, especially Sylvester, because Sylvester 
is not only the one who called the council, but he was the one who carried out the wishes of um, Ptolemy. What were the, the wishes of Ptolemy? Uh, the wishes of Ptolemy was to make this image of him known to the, to the world as being the savior of the world. So at this particular conference, that was accepted, ex with the exception of some notable priests, Arius was one, they rejected this. And those who rejected it were excommunicated from uh, the council. Now, that council also wrote the Apostles' Creed. And the Apostles' Creed that we have today was not the Apostles' Creed that came out of Nicaea. The Apostles' Creed that came out of Nicaea uh, said that Serapis was uh, the, made of the substance of God, and Serapis uh, and God were one and the same. Uh, Serapis was both human and God. And, and um, when this was rejected by other priests, they, as I said, they were excommunicated. When this conference ended, it ended with uh, the understanding that Serapis had been, is a spiritual entity. This spirituality of Serapis had no merit whatsoever. Um, this spirituality of Serapis came from a desire by the Greeks to rule um, Kemet and to, to uh, possess everything in Kemet. The priesthood who rejected uh, this, uh, the t their temples were closed. And in some cases, they were destroyed. And all of the sacred writings were taken from them and carried uh, to a, a place in Memphis where the um, what today the great library or library is. All those sacred writings were carried there. And they built an extension to that library uh, to house these sacred writings. And as, as we go further into this, what we began to see is now you have a, a spiritual entity, the Savior. In the Greek, Savior is Christo, from the word from which we get Christ. So you have Serapis, which is an idol, having attached to it the Savior, which is um, uh, 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 the Deliverer. They, at, at the Ephesus, they solidified that. At the council at Ephesus, where it is supposed to have been the second council of Nicaea, but, um, but by this time, Constantine was in charge of of uh, Kima, Kima because they had overcome the uh, the Greeks there. However, they left that Greek on the throne, but they had no control in Egypt. The Nicene uh, Second Nicene Conference went to Nicaea. But the conference was moved to the um, a castle uh, of uh, Constantine. And it was held in his, um, in his uh, castle, uh, whatever, they, where he lived. And- Pastor, Can I, can I yeah. stop you for a minute? Yeah. I, I want to slow you down a little bit because I think that's important. And I, 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 it's a pause there. I don't know what I see there, if anything. Because I've always thought the Nicene Conference was organized and manipulated by Constantine, by 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 the Roman Catholics. And you're saying that the first one was done by the Greek. Uh, and the other thing that I think was that you said was significant was that 
the priesthood that were Ron, a you part. there? Yeah, can, can you hear me? You're not hearing me? Hello? I can hear you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just I just wanted to pause and, and, and look at that for a minute because I, I I guess that's some new stuff that I've never heard before. Oh uh, what 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 all that actually means as as far as what we thought we understood or what we thought we knew. Um that you you're right. When we get to that, what you're gonna see is uh the Bible. There was no existence of a Bible during the time of the Nicene Conference. Uh, the, the, the Bible, it took him 751 years, some say a thousand, to get that done. But I'll get to that later on, okay? okay. So, so anyway, um, uh, Constantine was uh, the emperor of Rome, and, and he had... It changed from Nicaea uh, uh, um, to Ephesus. And what, what we ended up having uh, at, at that conference was Serapis became the spoken word, the savior and the leader of souls, leading souls to the light and, and receiving them after they die. This was done uh, during that period of, of um, Roman control. Now, again, the Romans did not change God, the, the Serapis, the, a representation of God in terms of Serapis. They embraced it. They worshipped uh, Serapis. And in doing so, um, uh, Constantine, because of, of his uh, connection with Sylvester, who had been chosen by um, Ptolemy, because of his connection with him, he too wanted to be baptized, so he got baptized. And what he did with Sylvester he, he promised Sylvester uh, the, the power and authority and the dignity and the emblems of, of the uh, emperor, which means that um, whatever Sylvester said was infallible. Whatever Sylvester said was inerrant, meaning that regardless of what Sylvester said, it could never be wrong. Does, that should sound familiar because of the inerrancy of the Pope. Um, so if we look at it from the status of a Pope, the first Pope was Sylvester, an African, who betrayed um, Kemet and, the, uh, and all of the Africans, to be honest with you. So having done this, um, Sylvester did not, I knew that, this power that was given to him was, tempor was temporary, but he accepted it anyway. And once they got to the place where uh, Serapis was called Messiah, uh, yeah, uh, it was Messiah, I'm, I was wrong. Jesus the Savior, Jesus the Messiah, two different things. Serapis the Savior, Serapis the, um, the Christ, Two different things. Now, Serapis was made Christos at Ephesus. So now he became the Savior and the Messiah, the Messiah who saves us. This is spiritual. This is what they were dealing with. What they were trying to do was match Serapis spiritually with the spirituality of the religious community in, in Kemet. The inhabitants of Kemet were not having it. They were not accepted. So when they made this, uh, made him Messiah, now we have a Messiah 
who is an image that has no uh, no uh, human about humanness about it at all, even though they had declared that he was both God and human. So now we have a problem. He's the spiritual Messiah, but there's no personage there. So we to another council, and I think it's the Council of Constantinople was was held. At this council, there was a, de a debate or discussion about this Serapis, God Serapis, being the savior of humanity, uh, being the one who is able to raise the dead, being the one who who leads souls to the light. But he has no; he does not have a name. They did not understand that Osiris. Isis were spiritual representation as opposed to gods that were worshipped. They were spiritual representation. They didn't know that. Keep in mind, they couldn't read. So they had no way of understanding it. And when they when they uh, got to the, the council of Constantinople, what happened is they felt like just like Osiris had a name, then there are Serapis needed the name. And the name that they gave Serapis, guess what it was? Zeus. And they stripped, they stripped um, Isis of all spiritual uh, essence. In other words, they said that um, this image of a, a woman called Mary, that they created Mary and said that she is the one who brought into existence a child through virgin birth. This child is Serapis. And Serapis became Zeus. And Zeus is the god of um, Greece, of, of the Greeks. And Jupiter was the god of the Romans, but they were the same god. They saw them as being the same. So they called this image of Serapis Zeus. There was no J in the language of the, of the Greeks. So it remained Zeus until other languages began to pick it. People from other countries spoke speaking other languages began to pick it up. When they did, the languages with the J, they instead of the um what appears to be an I in the uh, Greek, they wrote it with a J and it became to in English, it became Jesus. In the, in the Spanish, it became a Zeus. So if you do an etymology of, of that word, you will find that the name, the one that we call Jesus is actually Zeus. It was here at this point where Serapis um, became Zeus, became Jesus, where Serapis became the savior of humanity, where, where Serapis uh, became the spiritual essence of the creator of everything that is. In other words, um, this Zeus, this Jesus took on the image, took on the likeness, and I'm talking about spiritual likeness now, of Ra, who was the creator of everything. This Jesus became the Son of God, and 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 um, and and this Jesus was said to be the the uh, the Son of God, meaning the Son of the Rapist and Mary, and it was done with with, with and Mary had him. Uh, have been a virgin, a virgin, because the story goes that 
that um, Osiris was cut in little pieces and spread it throughout um, Kemet. And Isis collected the body parts with the exception of the penis. Could not, it could not be found. Isis hovered over Osiris desiring a son and she became impregnated as a virgin. That's, that was one of the um, one of the spiritual myths of um, Egypt. Now, why did why did Osiris and um, Isis have a son? What was this son's name? The son was Haru. Haru took on the um, the image of Jesus. I'm sorry, Jesus took on the image of Haru. The things that were said about Jesus were also um, said about Haru thousands of years before. If you will give me one second, I will, uh, I'm going to get that because I don't want to try to remember it. I want to read it to you. Hello? We're still here, George. Quick question for you, Rem Richard, or anyone else in the group. Um, Alexander the Great, he couldn't read. However, he was he was kind of brutal. Uh, who was the who was the the um who was he in um in union with? Was it Augustus Caesar? I know it wasn't Julius Caesar. Or was it Tiberius? Who was he in cahoots with? Because Alexander, he, he wasn't one that you would rely on intellect, intelligence, or creativity. Yet he was something fierce in battle. Who did he get his instructions from? Was it Augustus Caesar? Or was it Tiberius? Or who was it? Um, that aspect of history, uh, of antiqu the history of antiquity, I don't want to go there. And the reason I don't is because my presentation or whatever you want to call it is based upon the fallacy that has been given to us about Jesus. I do not, if I go into um, the Caesars, it's going to take us way off track. So I, I prefer to stay where we are uh, with the understanding that the Greeks were the first ones to conquer or uh, take over Egypt, that the Greeks were the first ones to force themselves on the throne, and that the Greeks, uh, in cahoots with the Romans, brought into existence Christianity. That's where I want to stay. The reason I want to is because this is difficult enough to understand. Not only is it difficult to understand, the, the names and the words that I am using, people are unfamiliar with that, with those words or names. And when you are unfamiliar with something, uh, names uh, of, uh, or foreign names, it's hard to hold them in your head and to follow the story. Not only that, um, when we are talking about uh, Jesus being uh, non-existent, that's a, that's a blow. And it, it's a blow to me even now, even though I did tremendous research to understand this, I'm still at a state of discomfort, not only teaching it, but also in a state of discomfort, holding it in my, in my, in my mind. Um, people, especially Africans, are more apt to believe what you can't prove, then you ought to believe what you can prove. When you ask about the proof of Jesus, it's in my heart. I feel it in my heart. Who told you to feel it in your heart? You didn't know nothing about Jesus until we were brought to this country. So who told you you feel it in your heart? Let's look at those things that can be proved. 
And the things that can be proven are the words that have spoken to you prior to what we are saying now. The, the idea of not being a Christian as we uh, flirted with in the past also means that if you're not a Christian, then what do you do with Jesus? And I'm going to talk about that. Uh, and George, I would appreciate it if you could hold that. Hello? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah question. We, we cool on that. Yes. Go ahead, Art. I have a question. Um, so you're saying Christianity began before Jesus because of of Serapis being called the savior and and, and then it, it evolving into Christos yes with the Greeks yes and the followers of Serapis were called Christians that's exactly what I'm saying okay so this was before Jesus now, I, I, um, the comparisons, <clears throat> 3,200 years before Jesus was born, Haru was um, with his mother, the virgin, until 12 years old when he was transformed into the beloved son of God as the only begotten of the Father in heaven. Jesus remained with his mother, the virgin, up to the age of 12 years when he left her to be about his father's business. Keep in mind, this is 3,200 years before Jesus was born. From 12 to 30 years of age, there is no record in the life of Haru. 12 to 30 years of age, there is no record in the life of Jesus. Haru at 30 years of age became an adult in his baptism by a new. Jesus, at 30 years of age, was made a man in his baptism by John the Baptist. Are you able to see the similarities there? Yep. Now, the, the, yes. the, yeah, I, I need to say this before you come in, okay? Keep in, also, Haru was not a son, S O N. Haru was S-U-N, son. We are talking about uh, the son, as we talked about some weeks ago, and, and it's a uh, movement uh, in terms of um, the winter solstice and, uh, and his return to the north. We talked about that. Jesus was made a man, uh, S-O-N, because they did not understand that Haru was the, 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 uh, the son of Isis and Osiris, the S-U-N, as opposed to the S-O-N. Why did they not know that? They could not read. And, and they were unable to read the documents, the sacred documents of Kemet, for them to have that understanding. Okay, go ahead. Just for just for clarity, the son is Haru and not Ra. Ra is is the creator. Ra, yeah, Ra is the creator of of everything. Ra is the light. Okay. Her, uh, Osiris and Isis are masculine and feminine energy, and from the from the energy of the universe came the sun. Can you see that? Okay. That's what this is talking about. It is no different than what we get in Genesis other than Genesis is written differently than how everything came into existence. Uh, if we were to compare Genesis to the beginnings of the, of, um, the earth, then you would see the comparisons there. Does that make sense? Is that clear? So one more time, I, I, 
give somebody else a chance to talk. I just want to make sure I'm seeing everything, right? So the masculine and feminine energy that you described is the masculine and feminine energy of raw. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. Just like Pastor. Just like Adam and Eve is the energy of Elohim. Can you see that? Yes. Okay. Yes. Go ahead, someone. Pastor, I have a question. Um sure. when you talked about Ptolemy and his last name, um, or the last name meaning meaning savior. Is that the beginning of the introduction of the quote unquote white savior um, for people of color? Yes. Um, that was not his last name. That was a, uh, that was, um, what is it? A title Been, uh, to limit the savior. That's what that was. Does that help? Yes, sir. So my question is, if he's saving these people, did he view them as savages? Uh, he, the whole, the Greeks and the Romans viewed the, the, uh, the Kushites as savages, simply because of the color skin, even though they saw everything that was um, in Kemet, the science, the astronomy, the chemistry, the mathematics, the written words, all of these things they had no clue about. And when they did learn them, they stole them as being their own. Aristotle has never been a philosopher. Everything that Aristotle wrote about philosophy came from, from Egypt. Um, Socrates' student, Plato, all of them stole from Egypt. And the, the guy who wrote uh, his last name is James. I think it's George James. I can't remember who wrote uh, Stolen Legacy. When he exposed all of this, he died a mysterious death. So what I'm saying to you is this has been kept under lock and key. And when I say lock and key, I mean literally lock and key in the Vatican. And I mean lock and key in the museum scattered around the world because they stole everything from Egypt. They had no culture. They had no art. They had no, uh, no sense of the universe itself. They had no sense of mathematics. Europe didn't know Jack until they came in contact with the Egyptians. Does that make sense? It does. Okay. So th they called them savages, but they were the most brutal. Well, they, yes. Well, it's projection. People call you what they are. Um, Makes sense, I sir. Thank you. I mentioned the Rosetta Stone earlier. There are, uh, on the Rosetta Stone, there are hieroglyphics, and, and, and there there's, um, uh, what is it? Air. Oh, God, I can't even pronounce the word in my head. H-E-I-R-A-I-C, language, which is uh, the heretic. heretic language. Thank you. Thank you. That That is the written language of the um, hieroglyphics. The third thing that you see on the Rosetta Stone are is the phonetic language. And the phonetic language was written by uh, Cushites as well. And that is the Greek alphabet. And from the Greek alphabet came the rest of the alphabets throughout Europe. Therefore, everything that is written and everything that is read Old, uh, is owed to the Kushites because that's where the, that's where the first alphabets came from and the, uh, Europe, the alphabets in Europe are based upon the Greek alphabets and the Greek alphabets were given to the Greeks by uh, the, um, the Africans. Does that make sense? Yes. See, 
So the last thing I want, that one of the last things anyway, I want to say about this is Haru um, in, in, was baptized. In his baptism, his transformation into the beloved son and only the God and the Father, the, the Holy Spirit represented, was rep the Holy Spirit represented by bird. Jesus, in his baptism, is held from heaven as the beloved son and the only begotten of the Father, God, and the Holy Spirit represented by a dove. Now, keep in mind, Peru, the 3,200 years before Jesus. Does that make sense? Yes. Now, how is it that that Jesus could be the progenitor of Christianity when Christians were in existence prior to Jesus' birth? Now, Jesus' birth took place in a council meeting. It took place from the minds of men who sought to control the African. The beginning, the control that the, the um, Europeans sought to control the Africans. Why did they not seek to control the Asians first? Why did they not go into Asia first? Europe is connected to Asia. Europe is not a continent. Europe at best is the peninsula. It's not. It is, so why did he go to Asia? Well, nothing there. They went to the place where, where shiny things existed. Gold, silver. That's what they went after. They went after precious metals. And in doing so, they had a serendipitous experience. They learn how to read. That's what precipitated uh, the theft of philosophy and science and uh, all of the sciences. Um, uh, medicine, astronomy, everything. None of those things would have been available to Aristotle, to none of the uh, so-called philosophers, unless uh, uh, it would not have been available to them if the uh, African had not given them a language, uh, a written language. They would not have been able to do it. And, and um, to this day, the 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 um the language is the key. Language is the key. The written language is the key to understanding anything. And 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 it had its genesis in Africa. Now, if we want to move forward, we can. Or uh, if not, we can pick up tomorrow. Because what Jesus comes into play, then that's when the lies really get started. The worst thing that ever happened to an African, it was teaching the European the right. Well, you, you, you mentioned the shiny things, but they still see after all these centuries, the value of Egypt is still very apparent with you stop, as we've talked about before, it is the only place in the earth that has its own science. Has a, you know, uh, so when you start looking at Egyptology and, and 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 what they're trying to discover, they still see a tremendous amount of value. Uh, well, the value that they see, Ron, uh, is uh, is in the images that were made. Because they thought these images were, were worshipped as gods, and that gave them value. Because they found them nowhere else in the world, uh, as, as as they were in Egypt. Of course, they found hieroglyphics 
in the Grand Canyon. They found yeah. how you know in South America. But I'm talking about the masks that were made. Um, I'm talking about the the um, <clears throat> the representations of Isis or Osiris, the 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 um the hawk. The the Pharaoh walked around with a um the ornament of a hawk on his on his uh, the back of his neck. And that ornament of the hawk uh spoke to being anointed. And the anointing of the Pharaoh came from the priesthood. They are the ones uh who chose the Pharaoh based upon how he lived his life and how he interacted spiritually. Now, how they determine that, I have no clue. That's one of the mysteries of Egypt uh, that that uh, has not been deciphered. Even the people who called us the N-word, the people who said that we were inferior could not deny that everything came out of Egypt, could not deny. But they call us everything, but still, there are, during my research, I found some of those who, who thought that white folks are superior, they wrote the truth about Serapis and Jesus. And we don't believe stuff unless white folk write it, or unless white folk tell us. What I am saying now is blasphemous to every African I know, except the folks I know in this, this telephone conversation or Zoom conversation. And probably some of you sound is blasphemous, blasphemous when, when blasphemy is not, nothing what we were taught. I could not sit back knowing what I see and not say it, especially after the, what came out of my mouth, Jesus didn't exist. I had no intention of doing this, none whatsoever. This is the most difficult thing that I had to have ever had to reconcile with. And I know that is the hard thing to swallow. It's very difficult to embrace. But I I had to do it because the truth must be told regardless of who gets upset as a result of it or regardless as to walk away from it. Does it matter to me? Yes. Is it going to stop me from, from uh, teaching the truth? No. There have been more people walk away from us than there are the ones who stay. I'm good with that because this is not for everyone to understand. It is for, hum it is for humanity to be able to receive it from the from uh, the, the macro. And things go into the macro based on questions and, and, and uh, based on statements of truth. Uh, tomorrow, I want to I want to respond to all of your questions. And yes, I was kind of nervous because of what I'm dealing with. Not only do I want to answer your, your question based on what we talked about today, I want to answer the question, so how do we approach the Bible now? And how do we approach this concept of Jesus now? Those are the questions I want to answer. One thing I want to leave you with, in 451 A.D., 451 A.D., The dark ages begun, and they lasted until 1455, when the Gutenberg Bible was printed. What happened during that period of time? The next thing I want you to see is this. Everything <clears throat> that we talk about before Jesus, we talk about in, in 332, Alexander died. And then we talk about um, 1,500 years later, Serapis and uh, 
and and Jesus, Serapis became Jesus 1,500 years later. So we go from 332 up to 1,500 B.C. After Jesus, we go from uh, 332 or uh, uh, up until 2020. So, so time on the calendar time after Jesus uh, continued forward. Before Jesus, it was back. It went backwards. Can you see that? Pastor, just remember, repeat that again, please. The the time. <clears throat> 300 years before Jesus, right? It began, uh, we go to um, uh, uh, 300 years before Jesus. Time okay. started over when Jesus was born because 1 AD is when Jesus yes. was born. Okay. So it starts over at the birth of Jesus. Got it? Interesting. Got it. Any, any questions about that? So I'm done until tomorrow with um, if you have questions, I know you do, write them down. If you don't want to ask the question, then send a text. Whatever question you have is not offensive. I want you to probe this deeply. You don't know how many times I wished that I was wrong and, and went through so many different sources and never found any source other than Christianity that was that said that Serapis was a pagan god. And and that's all they said about it. I'm done. If there are no questions or comments. This, this is Barbara. Um, uh, I um, just want to say that the thing that is striking to me, that strikes a chord, that resonates with me, is the fact that 3,200 years or so before there was uh, Abraham or Jesus or anybody, that there were these writings, these e Egyptian writings and hieroglyphics that talked about all of these things that mirror what Jesus did 3,200 years later. Um, so, I mean, that, I mean, that's where I am, and 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 it says to me that uh, that's foundational. And if we start there, where the foundation is, and build upon that foundation, we will all come to the same conclusion at some point in time that things were changed, things were manipulated, things happened in order to ensure that uh, Europeans were seen as the originators of all knowledge and of, of everything. But clearly, if you start at the foundation of where civilization began, and all of these things are actually inscribed on stones, hieroglyphics, 3,200 years prior to Jesus, uh, and 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 that's 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 where I'm I'm taking this. That's where I'm looking from. I'm looking at whatever happens on top of that. So uh, uh, that's what speaks to me loudly and resonates with me strongly. And and, and Barbara, I appreciate again what you just said because I think that if we look at the Holy Bible and we look at the Shabaka stone, which is the earliest writings of morality and spirituality, we can do that comparative analysis 
in terms of us being able to appreciate that foundation. And I believe that that's what's manifesting right now. And so it is, you know, spiritually enlightening for us to look at it from the book and look at it from the stones. So I just wanted to share those thoughts in terms of what you said, uh, Barbara. Thank you. Just something I wanted to add is uh, we we take a look at this journey we're on. We, I, I thought about it as Pastor was talking. I thought about the eighth sense and, and, and looking back, looking at these experiences and how you how you see yourself. I don't know if you guys remember when we first started talking about uh, understanding the beginning, going back to the beginning. And we went back and looked at the first chapter of Genesis and we made comparisons to John 3 when Jesus had the Nicodemus and experience. And we, we looked at those things. But that was a turning point. This We are truly back at beginning. And truth has taken us there. Uh, religion has been a part of this journey, but it, we've gone past that and we're going to see now uh, who and what we are and the strength of the stuff as Barbara said and, and George just just pulled together uh, this this journey is something else. And something else Pastor said that I had not even thought about, the, the uh, baptism and circumcision were in place uh, long before there were scriptures, and uh, so this this is this is very important, very enlightening. Thank you. Actually, <clears throat> baptism and uh, circumcision can be traced back over a hundred thousand years, and every bit of it relates to Africans. Now, the reason for circumcision, I, I, I don't know other than being a, a hygiene. The reason for the baptism, we could talk about that at some other point. I'm done. Right. Well, something Thank else you. that stood out to me, too, was when Pastor talked about the priest. And the priest being male and female, um, whereas it's all skewed in the Bible. Uh, well, it's, uh, let me take that back. It's skewed in the way Christians look at things, or at least King James Version Christians, anyway. Uh, <clears throat> that's one of the reasons. Uh, Christian did not allow people to read the Bible. Only the priests could read the Bible because um, they were afraid of what they may have missed when they uh, manipulated it. I'm done. Okay. Good place to take a stand, take a pause, y'all. Uh, thank you. Questions and comments, and we will resume tomorrow. And again, uh, as Pastor said, if you all uh, don't have my number, send it to, if you have questions and you don't want to ask, text it to Pastor or one of the other teachers and, and we'll be sure and talk about it, okay? Well, thank you. Have a great day. Thank you, everyone. See you tomorrow. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Take care, Pamela. Yeah.